So Hare Krishna, dear devotees, uh, thank you so much for joining us um, again. Uh, so this is our second session and of the, um, the Bhagavad Gita seminars. And before we start, we can do the invocation. Om Namo Bhagavati Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavati Vasudevaya. Um, first of all, before we start, I wanted to seek your good wishes and your blessings so that we can share uh, some information, some knowledge about Mahabharata. I think many of you will already know a lot about the Mahabharata, perhaps, well, probably more than I will know. But today, what we wanted to do was set the scene for the appearance of the Bhagavad Gita. Um, and wanted to share uh, what happened leading up to the Bhagavad Gita, the, the, to the recitation, the, the singing of the Bhagavad Gita by Lord Krishna to Arjun. It's a fasc fascinating pastime, and uh, it will take, uh, um, I think, a good hour. <laughs> so please bear with me. Uh, we're going to do a summary uh, of um, the Mahabharata, um, not all of it, up to the point where um, where the Bhagavad Gita, or, or up to the point just before the war begins. Um, and we won't cover every single aspect of the Mahabharata because it's, it's very, very detailed, but uh, we will try to cover the main, main aspects, main points of the Bhagavad Gita, of the uh, Mahabharata. Um, so, uh, Mahabharat is a very important scripture, actually. It's a tiyas, it's a historical account. It's got lots and lots of there are different teachings within the Mahabharat. Um, and it's it was composed by um, Vyasadev, the literal incarnation of the Lord. And it contains, it's the largest poem in the world, 110,000 verses. It's huge. So that's why we will not even scratch the surface with this presentation because Mahabharata is absolutely humongous. Great scripture. And the Bhagavad Gita forms an, an episode in the Mahabharata. It's a very small episode. If we consider it's only 700 verses, Mah, uh, Bhagavad Gita, compared to the 100,000, uh, 110,000 verses of the Mahabharata. But it is actually the absolute essence of Vedic teaching, the Mah Bhagavad Gita. The Mahabharata is considered smriti, uh, that is, which is remembered, um, and that, that which can change as well. However, the Bhagavad Gita is considered to be shruti, the because they're directly the words of the Supreme Lord. And these, are, uh, these principles that are stated in the Bhagavad Gita are eternal principles. They don't change according to uh, time and circumstance. They are eternal, whereas smriti can change according to the situation. And that's why we're studying the Bhagavad Gita today, because even though it was spoken or sung 5,000 years ago, and Krishna says, actually, the Bhagavad Gita is much older. I spoke it first to Vivaswan, he said, the sun god. <laughs> Fourth chapter, we'll come across that. So why are we still learning it? Because the principles are eternal. They haven't changed. So um, that's why it's as relevant today, if not more relevant today, than it was when Krishna sung it to Arjun. The main name Mahabharat is great. Maha means great. Bharat is uh, the Bharatas, Bharat. And it's actually the story of the Bharatas. There was a king, King Bharat. He was a early ancestor of both the Pandavas and the Kauros. Um, and generally this word Bharat is used for uh, India. It's, it's replaced by India. Unfortunately, India is a name we don't necessarily like. We don't, we try to you know, use India because the spiritual name of this country is uh, Bharat. So Bharat is much more. Our Guru Maharaj would always say Bharat. And if anybody said uh, India, he would correct them immediately. No, it's Bharat. Um, which is, and we are, yeah, exactly right. We are Bharat, yeah. Bharatias, not Indians. <laughs> Not Indians. <laughs> Indian, actually, my guru used to say it's a very, uh, it's a demeaning connotation to it. Indigenous, it's referred mm -hmm. to those who are backward. 
So India is not necessarily a nice term. And I think recently there was a move in the Indian parliament to try to change the name of India to Bharat, but I'm not sure how that's going. But anyway, that's beside the point. King Bharat was unique because he did not appoint his sons as king, as was the tradition. The kings, uh, the, the sons would be, the eldest son would be appointed king automatically when the king died or retired. But because he saw that his sons were not qualified, he appointed another qualified person as king, which was very unusual at that time. So this is where, uh, one of the reasons why Bharat was named Bharat because of this great king. Um, and then after many, many generations, King Shantanu appeared um, in, within this distant yeah, dynasty and he became the king of Hastinapur. So this is really where Bhar Mahabharat starts. Um, Shantanu, he was married to the beautiful Ganga. And this is the personification of um, the river Ganga. She's a, a goddess, a demigod. She's actually associate of the Supreme Lord. She agreed to marry him. He didn't know who she was. <laughs> it's just that she was the most beautiful person in the world. And she married him, he married her. Uh, on the condition that he would never question her actions. So yeah, over the next seven years, there was a lot of heartbreak for Shantanu because every time a son was born, Ganga used to throw into the river and kill the son. This happened seven times, but he couldn't question her because he promised her he will never um, argue or question her, what she's, her actions. But he eventually, when it came for the eighth son, he snapped. <laughs> he asked his wife, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And who are you? <laughs> so, of course, uh, at that time, Ganga Mata, she revealed herself to Shantanu and told him the reason why she was doing what she was doing. There were celestial being, beings that were cursed to become humans. And one of them was cursed to remain on earth. The others, they were human beings for a short period of time. She released them from the curse. But unfortunately, the eighth one, he's gonna be here for some time. But she said to him that since you've questioned me, I have to go and I'm gonna take our son with us. His name will be Devrat. And don't worry about him. He will come back to you at the appropriate time. So Devrat was taken to the heavens by Ganga Mata. And he was trained by great, great personalities. Pershuram, Vashishta, Brihaspati, so many others as well. He got so much uh, knowledge, so much strength. And is better known as Bhishma. Bhishma is one of the central characters of the Mahabharata and one of the most important uh, characters. He received his name Bhishma, which means terrible wow, terrible wow, terrible resolve, because he found out that his father, he, he'd fallen in love again. Ganga had gone, so his father was depressed, but then he met Satyavrati, Satyavati, who was one of the most beautiful ladies, and he fell in love with her, deeply in love with her. Now, Satyavati is a very interesting personality. She uh, was previously also the mother of Vyas. Um, there was an incident that took place with Parasara Muni. Uh, it was a very auspicious time. And he said to her, Satyavati, that um, this is a good time and uh, a great soul will be born uh, if we unite. And this soul who was born was Vyas there. But Parasara Muni was very powerful. He preserved Satyavati's uh, virginity. So anyway, um, Satyavati or her father had a condition that uh, if I marry you, then my son has to be the king. And this condition was, uh, Santanu didn't like that condition because that meant Bhishma could not be king. Bhishma found out because his father was very de depressed. He found out the cause of the depression that uh, he'd fallen in love with Satyavati and yet couldn't marry her because of this uh, condition. So he made a vow. He said, he made a vow that I will never claim the throne and 
I will never marry. I will, ne I will protect whoever is on the throne. This is, for a Kshatriya, this is an unheard of vow. They always marry, not just one wife. They may have many wives. Um, that was to, because the Kshatriyas were very, very powerful. So anyway, um, he made this vow for the happiness of his father. So he gave up his own happiness for the happiness of his father. This is really, Bhishma is one of the um, greatest personalities uh, who um, throughout the Bhabara will see him. Uh, he, his, his, his vows will be questioned and he would be um, <laughs> really tested, but he never gave up his vow. So really, and he's not just an ordinary person. He's also one of the Mahajans. There's only 12 of them. Mahajan means somebody who, Maha, great Jan person, great person, Mahajan. Uh, they are fully aware of the spiritual truths. Um, so he's one of those 12 people. So no ordinary person, Bhishma. Anyway, years later, uh, Satyavati and Shantanu, they had two children, Chitrangada and Chitavirya. Uh, Chitanga died young when he was in the battle. With Chitavirya, he became old enough to marry. And Bhishma, he did the work of finding his brides. He kidnapped, adopted three beautiful ladies, Amba, Ambika, and Ambalika. Um, they were about to be, uh, there was about to be a swambu where they were going to be um, uh, getting married but Bhishma abducted them because they were very qualified to marry Michitabiria. Anyway, when he brought them back, he found out that Amba had already decided on an husband. So Bhishma said, okay, you go and we go to your beloved. But the beloved also abandoned her. You have been conquered by Bhishma. You belong to another. I cannot have somebody else's rejected uh, wife or person as a wife. So Amba was uh, actually abandoned. She went back to Bhishma and said, well, you have to marry me now. You conquered me, you marry me. But Bhishma had made the vow. So he refused and Amba was furious. And she in turn made a vow that one day she will be the cause of his death. Even though uh, Ganga had been given, sorry, the uh, Bhishma had been given the um, boon. blessing, yeah, boon by his father that you can choose the moment you want to die. So he was eternal. If he was effectively uh, immortal, he could choose when he, he could choose never to die. <laughs> but Amba was so furious. He said to him, "I will be the cause of your death. You can bet on it." <laughs> so, and the importance and power of vows are evident throughout the Mahabharata. We'll see this time and time again, how people will make vows, they'll stick to them, um, no matter what. When both his half-brothers died uh, prematurely without children, so which the Vedya also passed away childless. Again, Bhishma, he, he was requested by Satyavati, you marry now, there's no need for your vow anymore. It doesn't come into practice and there's no children now to worry about. So you, you get married and have some children. Um, but he wouldn't even uh, break his vow for his, his stepmother. He wouldn't do it. He said, no, I've made a vow. I'm going to stick to it. <laughs> so um, anyway, um, then Satyavati was reminded that you have a son, you have another son, and that is Vyastev. You call upon him and he can impregnate the two princesses, um, Ambika and Ambelika. So that's what he did. He, he approached, uh, he was invited and the princesses, um, uh, they didn't like the idea because uh, Vyastev was a sage, you know, he, he'd taken a vow of po poverty, he was, looked pretty rough. Um, <laughs> he um, yeah, probably didn't smell too good. <laughs> uh, yeah, he was uh, pretty, uh, 
tough looking. <laughs> so the first uh, Ambika, I think, she closed her eyes, and Bhishma said, oh, "Sorry, you know, um, yes. uh, Vyasadev said to Satyavati, his mother, that uh, this boy is going to be blown blind because uh, Ambika closed her eyes." And the second wife, second princess, she went white. She went, went pale. So Satya, so Satyavati again was informed by Vyasadev that your son, uh, your grandson, is going to be pale looking. <laughs> so Satyavati wasn't happy. So she said, okay, please, Vyastev, try one more time. So she requested the princess, uh, princesses, one of them, please volunteer. But instead, what, what they did was actually they put forward a maidservant. <laughs> now, the maidservant, their maidservant, she was a very honorable personality. And she gave great respect to Vyastev, who was very happy with her. So what was produced out of their union was a great personality called Vidhur. Now Vidhur, although regarded as a Shudra because he was born to a maidservant, he was a very, very qualified personality. In his past life, he was actually Dharamraj. So he's an incarnation of Dharamraj. Very wise, very attentive. So the blind son, he was called Dhatarastra, the pale the pale one was called Pandu. <laughs> now, Dhritarashtra was older, but because he was blind, he was not necessarily fit for the throne. So Pandu became the king. Pandu married to Kunti Devi. Kunti Devi, very interesting personality. She's a cousin of Krishna. No, aunt. Um, oh, sorry, auntie. Thank you, auntie. Her and Vasudev were brothers and sister, and Vasudev was the father of Krishna. And Madri, very beautiful. So one day, and something very unfortunate happened. Uh, Pandu was hunting a deer in the forest, and he shot a deer. And unfortunately, that deer was actually a Brahmin priest in disguise, and he was mating with um, his wife at that time. So this priest, this sage cursed Pandu that you will also die if you ever try to mate with your wives. So knowing he couldn't have children, Pandu resigned the throne. He um, went to the forest to live as a sage with his wives. And he was actually highly qualified. Uh, he was um, uh, very learned and the sages loved him. But they had no children. But Kunti then re revealed to um, Pandu that uh, she's got a great gift given to her. She can invoke demigods at will who will be able to give children to her. Now, she didn't reveal how that happened. Oh, she did reveal that. She said she got that boon. She didn't reveal that she had in, um, already invoked her that uh, boon once. That we'll talk about a bit later on. But Pandu became very pleased because they, he invoked Dharamraj from whom they received the son, Yudhisthir, who's regarded um, as an incarnation of Dharamraj. They invoked the wind god, who's very, very powerful. Hence came Bhim, the strongest of men, son of Vayu. They invoked Indra. And from Indra came the wonderful Arjun, irresistible warrior. <laughs> and Kunti Mother was so generous. She knew P Madri would be um, jealous somewhat, you know. She'll have sons, but Madri doesn't have. So on behalf of Madri, she invoked the uh, twins, Ashwini twins. Mm -hmm. And Nala Kuver, Nala, N Nakul and Sadev came. Nakul was the most beautiful prince, and Sardev was an astrologer. He could tell the future. <laughs> this was just some of their qualities. So they had five children, and they were called the Pandavas, popularly known as the Pandavas, and they were all very, very happy. This is Madri with her twins. Unfortunately, one day, um, Kshatriyas are known for their passion and being close to beautiful women doesn't suit. 
And one day he, he surrendered to his passion for Madri and he fell dead. And Madri, very devoted to him, joined him on the funeral pyre, leaving Kunti Mata with the five boys. And she raised them to the best of her ability. She was actually an amazing personality. Anyway, meantime, Tatarastra was made the king. But because of his blindness, this king, this kingship was like a caretaker role until uh, the eldest of the Pandavas uh, is of age. Dhatarastra also was married, Gandhari, uh, another very loyal personality. And um, he, um, they became pregnant at roughly the same time, actually, uh, or Gandhari and um, Kunti Mata. Now, Gandhari was extraordinary because she, when she found out her husband, future husband is, gonna, is blind, she also decided, I cannot be better than my husband. <laughs> she also voluntarily took a blindfold. So she, for the rest of her life also, she never saw. So this is actually, uh, she's an extraordinary personality. I cannot be better than my husband. This is really um, Vedic culture at its best. Of course, people do argue that she should have seen so that she could have guided her husband. That's a different argument. From her point of view, she could not be better than her husband, which was uh, extraordinary. Anyway, she was pregnant for a very, very long time, two years. And when the pregnancy uh, you know, fructified, it, it was like a big ball of flesh. Now, it said that she actually was very unhappy when she heard Kunti Mata had given birth. So she, partly she was born, uh, just this ball of flesh was born. But Vyas Dev came at that time and he instructed them how actually you are eligible to have a hundred sons and you split the balls into a hundred parts and put them in jars of ghee, which is what they did. And eventually the hundred sons of were born, the Kauravs. When the first was born, his, he, his Duryodhan and very sinister omens uh, of, uh, appeared of violence greeted his arrival in the world. Jackals were howling, strong winds were blowing, fires were raging through the city. Dhatarasta was very worried. Vidur told him, this is not a good sign. You should kill your son immediately. <laughs> Vidur didn't mince his words. <laughs> But of course, Dhatarastra ignored his advice. Uh, now, Dhatarastra, his character was very weak. Now, he, he allowed his bl physical blindness to become a, a refusal to face reality, unwillingness to confront hard decisions. And he was constantly led by Duryodhan, especially in later years. Whenever Duryodhan wanted something, and Dhritarashtra would say no, because he knew this is not right, Duryodhan would go into a fit, and usually he would end up saying, I'm going to kill myself. And Dhritarashtra would never be strong enough to counteract that argument. So he was pretty much led by Duryodhan, who was also misled by the brother of Gandhari, Shakuni, who was a very cunning, devious person. Um, and much of the Mahabharat uh, intrigue is down to uh, the character of uh, Shakuni. Anyway, the Pandavas and the Kauravas, partly again because of the winding up of Duryodhan by Shakuni, they were always uh, at each other's uh, necks. They were loggerheads against each other. Especially Duryodhan didn't like Bhim, tried to poison him, tried to kill him in many different ways. Anyway, nothing succeeded because uh, these are the Pandavas, they're protected. No matter how hard the Koros tried, they could never kill uh, the Pandavas. Anyway, one day, a wonderful teacher, glorious teacher called Dronacharya appeared and he uh, offered to train the Pandavas and the Koros. Now he was on a secret mission actually. The reason being, he had a great friend in his school time, childhood times, Dropad. And Dropad was actually a prince, and then he became a king. 
One day Drona went to see Dropad, saying, reminding him of the friendship, because they'd made a promise to each other that whatever belongs to me also belongs to you. Half is mine, half is yours. Drona went and said to Dropad that, uh, do you remember our friendship? And Dropad just denied it. Uh, he had the Dronacharya thrown out of the palace and he said to him, only equals can be friends. Yeah, it was quite a, he was a Kshatriya and Drona was a Brahmin. And uh, Dropad being a little puffed up thinking that I am a Kshatriya, I'm a king, I'm far better than this Drona, had him thrown out. So Drona had in his heart this uh, motive of revenge and he wanted to train the Pandavas uh, to avenge this uh, insult. So it did happen. <laughs> it did happen. Um, the Pandavas conquered Dropad at one point. The Kauravas also tried the Hundred Sons, but they failed. The, the five brothers, however, managed to conquer Dropad. And then they gave the kingdom to Dronacharya. And Dronacharya gave half of it back to Dropad, saying, Now we are equals. <laughs> but of course, in the heart of Dropad, uh, that, that was the seed for great revenge uh, and uh, he did a fair bit of tapasya and uh, out of that tapasya came two uh, incredible children. One was this, this the Dumnya. He came out of the fire of the yagya that they were preparing and that yagya, the intention was to prepare offspring to kill, a son to kill um, Dronacharya. <laughs> What a reason to do a yagya. <laughs> but anyway, it all adds to the intrigue of the Mahabharata. And also a daughter came forth, Draupadi. Um, and an oracle said that she will bring destruction on an unrighteous ruler. And that is the Dhrastra. There was a third child, uh, but that didn't come out of the fire. That was out of marriage. That was Sikandi. Sikandi was actually an incarnation <laughs> in a previous life. I mean, he, he, he was a boy, but in his previous life, he was a girl called Amba. And you remember Amba wanted to seek revenge on Bhishma. So Mahabharata is a lot about vows, it's a lot about revenge, a lot of intrigue, fascinating pastimes. Um, worth reading if you haven't read it. And many of you, I'm sure, will have read it already. Anyway, we'll just carry on a little bit more. Later in the war, um, Drona and Bhishma will fight on the sides of the Kauravs due to their loyalty to the king. But because uh, also their mortal enemies, the Tarasa and Sikandi were this on the... Dumnya. Oh, sorry, this is the Dumnya and um, Sikandi were on the side of the Pandavas. So we'll see that a little bit later on. So Dronacharya recognized uh, Arjun superiority as a uh, master of arms, especially the bow, and he favored him with special training. And one time they had a competition, the whole school. Uh, Dronacharya had put a wooden bird in a, uh, in a tree and he asked them, each one of them, come forward and tell me what you see. There's a target in the tree. What do you see? So the princes would answer, oh, I see your lotus feet. I see my brothers. I see the tree. Somebody even said, oh, I see a, I see a bird. <laughs> that, that was probably his son, Ashwatthama. Um, but then he called upon Arjun and he asked him, what do you see? And Arjun answered, I only see the bird. In fact, I only see the eye of the bird. So this was a test that... Um, Dronacharya had uh, put forward to show that actually this is a proper disciple who, who will only see the target of his guru. So this is a very, very important lesson for us in our lives as well. We can be diverted by so many different things and miss the real point of life. The real point of life is to reestablish our relationship with God. If we miss that point, we will miss the point of life. So this is a very important instruction in the, in the Mahabharata from this pastime of Arjun and Dronacharya. And Dronacharya at that time rewarded his uh, student with this Brahmastra, which is a very powerful weapon. Uh, later on, and they did a uh, event to show the prowess of 
Donacharya's students and his, his, the power of his learning. At that time, somebody very extraordinary appeared. His name is Kern. Now, Kern is a, such an incredible personality. He was Kunti's firstborn. If you remember that picture where we saw the sun god appearing before Kunti, she had this boon from Durvasa Muni and she couldn't believe that she could invoke a demigod to give her a son. So she tried the mantra. This was in her, when she was a young girl in her father's palace. So she tried the mantra and the sun god appeared. And she wondered what to do. And the sun god said, well, I have to give you a child. <laughs> Kunti said, I'm not married. Doesn't matter. You've invoked me. My duty is to give. What you do with the child is up to you. So this Kern was born at that time and Kunti abandoned him. On the, on the river. Now he's the sun god, sun. He's the incarnation of the sun god in, in, in effect. So he's very, very powerful, extraordinarily powerful. And he came in this arena and he challenged the top student, Arjun. And at that time, Kern didn't know who his real mother was, Kunti Mata. She was raised by uh, a wife of a chariot driver, Sanjay's wife. So he was considered to be a Shudra, if you like. <laughs> but he was the greatest Kshatriya, the sun god's son. <laughs> so anyway, the Pandavas mocked him. Duryodhan, however, realized, hey, this is, I, I've got an opportunity to make a really strong ally. And he offered him the, the kingdom of Anga, made him Angaraj. So he became a Kshatriya, from a Shudra to a Kshatriya, from a Kshatriya to a Shudra to a Kshatriya. <laughs> so this is an example of something that really we have to guard against. Because Kern then swore eternal friendship to Duryodhan. No matter what, I'm with you because of that one act. So if we're not careful in our life, we may get some very bad association and that can completely ruin our life if we're not careful. We have to be very careful who we keep as our company. Kern was actually uh, the son of a sun god. So very important personality and full of character and um, you know integrity. But by one friendship, he destroyed everything. Everything that was good about him was completely finished by this one moment's uh, association with Duryodhan. <laughs> so bad company can completely finish even a good person. So that's why, like even today, we were reading in the Srimad Bhagavad Puran that um, Dhruv Maharaj was doing great tapasya. When he had the darshan of the Lord, the thing he asked for first was, let me be with your devotees. Let me always be with your devotees. So this is the association which we try to keep. Try to keep association, try to keep friendship with those who are friendly to God, who love God, who want to be with God, who want to talk about God, who want to chant about God. Anyway, we'll carry on. Okay. Kern's uh, lowly caste will haunt him throughout the Mahabharata, right? But that's not what's haunting him. What's haunting him is this bad company that is kept. That's what's finished him off completely. Because ultimately, this caste, that would have come through if he had not um, kept friendship with Duryodhan. That's what destroyed him. Later at a contest to win Drupadi as a bride, she rejects him outright because he was from a servant's family. For a person who desired to be measured by his accomplishments, living under this shadow was unbearable. And that was just an ego problem because he knew he, knew he was strong. He just he didn't know who he was. <laughs> but he lost his identity really when he associated with himself, himself with Duryodhan. As a child of the sun, Kern was born with golden armor over his skin. And look at this, this, the glory of Kern, right? Later, the god Indra tricked Kern into giving this divine protection anyway. Actually, Kern knew 
This is Indra, and he's come to take my gold. But he didn't stop. He gave. <laughs> so Kern actually was a very, very charitable, an amazing personality. But company destroyed him. <laughs> anyway, Kunti remained a virgin. That was a blessing of um, the sun god, even after Kern was born. So the Pandavas, they escaped many plots to kill them. One time they did the house of, house of luck. They, the Ryondan built a house for them, which was made of highly flammable materials. And they put that uh, house on fire. But the five of them and their mother, they escaped. Other, the builder himself, uh, Purochan, I think it was mm -hmm. his name, he was killed with his wife and children. So everybody thought the Pandavas had died. So the Pandavas, they decided to live in hiding. And this was also the advice of Vidur to see what happens now. They think you're dead. Let's see what actions take place. And at least you're safe for some time now. So many pastimes happened when they were in the forest. There was uh, Hidimbi, uh, who was a Rakshash uh, beam married her after killing his, uh, her uh, brother. And they had a wonderful son, uh, I can never say that, who was actually very, very, he was a Rakshish, but actually because he was a son of Bhim, he was a great devotee. And he helped the Pandavas in the battle a lot. Anyway, then whilst they were still in disguise, they went to the Swamvar of Draupadi. They heard from the sages. They were always uh, accompanied by sages. Um, but they heard that this daughter of Draupadi was going to be married. So they went. They went to, to the disguised as Brahmins. And the funny thing was, uh, none of the Kshatriyas could meet the uh, target that had been set for the Samvar of uh, Draupadi. There was a fish on the ceiling, uh, which was going round and round, and the warrior had to look at the uh, reflection of that target and shoot it without looking at the target. Nobody could uh, actually get it right. Kern perhaps could have, but she, he was uh, basically told by Draupadi, no, you can't, uh, you're not in the right cast. Um, so then Arjun had a go, the, um, and uh, the amazing thing was he, he shot the target. He shot the target and he won Draupadi as his wife. And uh, everybody was shocked because they didn't recognize this is Arjun. Even though he had uh, strong muscles and was a brave looking personality, no, they didn't, it didn't click except, of course, to Krishna and Krishna knew. Krishna was, this is the first time Krishna comes in this pastime of the Mahabharata. So we'll talk a little bit about Krishna in a minute, but uh, just to carry on, um, Krishna and Balaram were present to the Swamvar and Krishna due to the Pandavas' val valorous appearance immediately recognized the five Pandavas, even though they were disguised. So who is Krishna? Um, he's also very deeply disguised. Not many people understand who actually Krishna is. We might sort of know he's God uh, or incarnation of Vishnu perhaps. But actually the revealed scriptures, the Brahma Samhita, the Srimad Bhagavad Puran, the Bhagavad Gita reveal who is Krishna. He is Swayam Bhagavan. He is the original Supreme Personality of Godhead. He has many expansions. Balaram, this quadruple, Narayan, another quadruple expansion, Mahavishnu, then Garbuddhaksha Vishnu, Rudhaksha Vishnu. These are all expansions of the Supreme, original Supreme Personality of God, Krishna. So even within our own community, we may not understand this, but this is according to uh, the revealed scriptures. There is no difference between Krishna and Balaram, between Krishna and Shiradaksha Vishnu because they are all supreme. But there's only one God who has many expansions. Sometimes we make the mistake in Hinduism thinking there are many, many gods. No, one God 
who has many expansions. He has many devatas who help him run this universe. He has many devotees. So we won't go into too much detail about this, but we could spend a lot of time just discussing this. Some people believe that Vishnu is the original because when Vishnu came in Mathura, then he turned into Krishna. But actually, that's not according to the scriptures. But we don't argue because it's the same person, Vishnu and Krishna, it's the same one person. But we should understand that actually the original Supreme Person from whom, with whom we can have all the different Leela, Rasas, relationships. With Vishnu, there's only one relationship, servant, that's it. You cannot be his lover. You cannot be his friend. You could not be his parent. You can only be his servant. But with Krishna, the full range of different types of relationships are available to his bhakta. And that is why he is Swayam Bhagwan. Anyway, Krishna comes in this pastime and he comes uh, in, 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 on this planet 5,000 years ago as a cowherd boy, then he's a king in Dwarka. He's very disguised. Hardly anybody present at that time recognizes Krishna as a Supreme Lord. He's very humble. Even during the battle, if we see Krishna's activities, he took the role of a chariot driver, a low position. This is the humility of God. He doesn't like to advertise himself. Okay. Anyway, uh, I'll move on. My wife's just uh, prompting me. <laughs> <laughs> Moving along. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll never finish. So, um, Arjun took his beautiful bride, Draupadi, to his mother. And he said, I've won a great prize. <laughs> and Kutni Mata, she always had one mantra, share it with everybody, share it with your brothers. <laughs> but when she said that, it was a big shock. What do you mean share? This is my wife. So Kunti became upset and she said, well, you, you, why did you say this is, your, this is your prize? Now I've said it, how are we gonna undo this? So this was like another wow. Her statement was taken like a wow, even though it was a mistake cannot be undone. So eventually all five brothers married the beautiful Draupadi. And then Krishna explained to them. He found them. He introduced himself. He explained to them that don't worry. This is part of what uh, is, is your karma, but it's also an important part of your destiny. So don't worry. Draupadi prayed to Shiva for her husband, but she, when he appeared, she said it five times. And Shiva said, no problem, Tatastu, you can have five husbands in your next life. <laughs> so don't worry, it's a boon from Shiva. So they accepted it. And, um, it, uh, and of course, between Krishna and the Pandavas, there was an immediate rapport between Quint Kunti and Krishna. Kunti knew who Krishna was from the moment that he, he was there. She knew this is the Supreme Lord. And the Pandavas also had wonderful respect for Krishna as their guide and the Lord. They knew this is an extraordinary personality, the supreme personality of Godhead. So um, now Krishna, uh, he advised them that, uh, you know, this tension with the Kauras is, is, is actually not just a family rivalry. There's more universal consequences with this uh, than you think. So he advised them that you should go to the Pand uh, to Dhatarastra and um, regain what belongs to you. So Dhatarastra, they went back, they, they listened to Krishna very much. And uh, Dhatarastra was not willing to step down and give you this the, the crown, the king, the, the kingdom. In fact, he was set on his son being the king. So the, 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 the fact that suddenly um, the Yudhisthira and the Pandavas there showed up alive, not just alive, but with now with a wife, not just an ordinary wife, Draupadi, um, that was a big shock. So somehow or other, he was convinced by Vidur and Bhishma to give something 
give half of the kingdom to you. This you've got to give something, otherwise there's going to be a war immediately. So they get the Torah to say, okay, let's split this kingdom and give them this beautiful land called Pakanda Past, which was actually nothing but jungle and a desert. <laughs> now Yudhisthira was such a great personality. He could have said, what? No, give me something better. But he was fantastic as a as a nephew. <laughs> he said, yes, we will take that. So then, um, oops, let's go back. Okay. Uh, so then they turned this kind of prast. So in the interest of moving along a little bit quicker, they turned this kind of prast into a most magnificent kingdom called Indraprast. And they did it with the help of Agni, who ate the forest. And in that forest was somebody called Maya, who was living there. Arjun saved him. And, uh, and Krishna and Arjun saved uh, Maya. And Maya was no ordinary person. He could build uh, most amazing palaces, amazing um, places. Uh, made of illusion, that's right, the Maya. <laughs> so he built them better palace than anybody ever had, uh, better than what Vishwakarma could do. Uh, and Vishwakarma was this, the architect of the demigods. So he built them a palace which um, was, if you went in the palace and you looked at uh, the floor, you would think, oh, this is water. I better avoid it. But actually it was not, it was land. Or it would look like land, but actually it was water. So he turned this, uh, the Yudhisthira actually turned this land into um, the, the most valuable land, most valuable kingdom. And he was declared king of kings. Duryodhan, oh, his heart broke, especially when he went to the palace and he saw the magnificence, the gold everywhere. How did this happen? How did Kanda past end up like this? His envy grew so much. In fact, at one point, he also unfortunately fell into a pool thinking it was glass, but actually it was, um, sorry, thinking it was uh, a floor, land, uh, but he fell in because it was actually water. So at that time, everybody was laughing at him and that made him even more angry more determined to, you know, um, trick, defeat these, these Pandavas. Anyway, Shakuni had a plan and he invited Yudhisthir uh, through Dhatarastra to a game of dice. Shakuni was an infamous dice player. He, he was a very tricky personality. And Yudhisthir, he knew, will never say no to his uncle. The Tarastra. And this is the duty of a Kshatriya. When you're challenged as a Kshatriya, if you don't take up the challenge, you admit defeat. So this is agreed, yes, let's have a, let's have a game. <laughs> Many thinkers believe that that was a wrong decision, but actually what could he do? He was challenged and a Kshatriya never shies away from a challenge. And Duryodhan, he was ruled by his uncle. The, the arson was the idea of his uncle, the dice game, and uh, Duryodhan was just a little pawn, and he was always come, you know, threatened to commit suicide if he didn't have his way, and Dhritarashtra always gave in. Anyway, the, war, the game started. The, 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 the Sukuni cheated them out of everything. Yudhisthira lost not just his kingdom, he lost his brothers, he lost everything he had. He lost himself. Then he even put Draupadi as part of the uh, wager. And he lost her as well. And then she was dragged in the court by her hair. And this is one of the most uh, disgraceful acts in the Mahabharata. This is the reason why the car was lost. And, but she challenged, she was very determined, she was Shatrani. She challenged the Koros, wait a minute. How can somebody who's already lost himself wager somebody else? Yudhisthira already lost himself. He couldn't, he can't wager me. Nobody could answer her, even Bhim, even Bhishma, sorry, couldn't answer the question. 
laid down. Vidura answered, Nes, you're right. And one of the brothers as well of uh, Bikarma, he also defended Durpadi that no, this is not right. But unfortunately, um, things really went pear-shaped at that time. Uh, even though she was married to the five strongest personalities on the planet, they could not defend her. Kern insulted her. Again, bad association. He called her a prostitute. <laughs> Duryodhan, he wanted her to sit on his thigh. <laughs> and Dushashan did the worst thing. He tried to strip her naked. And she did the only thing she could. She had the five greatest warriors on the planet, couldn't defend her. She appealed to Dhritarashtra. He was blind. She appealed to Bhishma. Now Bhishma could have done something. Bhishma should have done something. But there was some transcendental Leela going on between him and Krishna, which stopped Bhishma acting. But Bhishma, it was his duty at that time to pick up his bow and shoot down all of these miscreants, every single one of them, shoot them dead. That was his duty. But if he had done that, there would have been no Bhagavad Gita. And without the Bhagavad Gita, we would be lost in this world. So we owe Bhishma great debt of gratitude because he didn't do what he should have done. Krishna inspired him not to act at that time. And uh, Draupadi was left with no option. She took shelter completely of Sri Krishna. And you can see here, Sri Krishna, whilst Dushashan was one of the strongest persons in the world, could not disrobe her because Krishna provided unlimited sari. This is a great example of surrender. We in this world are completely engulfed by Maya, completely trapped in this world, in this body, with danger all around us. Nobody can save us from any danger. And we can see that, uh, especially through this current crisis about the virus, that this virus can come and attack and there's not much we can do. And we now have several personal experiences of this. Our only shelter is Krishna, our only shelter of the Supreme Lord. So this is a fantastic example how one can take shelter of the Supreme Lord and be protected. Okay. Wow. Okay, now Draupadi was protected. She swore revenge, avenge, to avenge this despicable act. Dhritarashtra, he realized Something's at play here now. I have to do something to stop her anger. He apologizes. He gives back everything to the husband, hus uh, to, to Draupadi, to the husbands. Um, so I'm just going to have to rush it a bit. So um, the Ryodan, they decide, okay, let's have one more dice game. And they had that. Again, the Pandavas were cheated out of that game. And they had to spend 12 years in exile. And the 13th year hidden. If they were found in that 13th year, they'd have to again spend another 12 years in exile and so on. Now, this, so they went to the forest. They were accompanied by Sandilya Muni, many Brahmins with them. They were actually um, had great company with them. And Yudhisthira always had this desire to regain the kingdom so that he can uh, always look after 10,000 Brahmins. That was one of the reasons why he was allowed to reconquer this kingdom, apart from being a devotee of God, of course. Bhim and uh, Dupadi were always um, <laughs> chiding Yudhisthira, chiding, uh, you're weak. Why did you let this happen? Arjun acquired weapons during this time, knowing that there's going to be a big fight, as did Kern. Um, Kern was uh, cursed actually by Pashuram because he went to learn from Pashuram, not revealing himself as a Kshatriya. And when Pashuram found out, he said, well, whatever I've taught you, when you need it the most, it's not going to be there for you. <laughs> um, in their exile, 
They saved Duryodhana at one point. This again shows the greatness of Yudhisthir. Bhim and Arjun didn't want to save Duryodhana from the Gandharva's attack. But Yudhisthir said, well, this is a family matter. You go and save Duryodhana, we'll sort him out later. At the moment, you cannot let the Gandharvas beat the family. The Kuru dynasty's uh, reputation is at stake. And Duryodhana, when he was rescued like that by the Pandavas, <laughs> uh, he was really depressed. But Sakuni and um, Khan would always inspire him to become more and more horrible. <laughs> uh, this is quite an important incident that took place, which is very instructive. Yudhisthir, one time, his brothers were drinking water from a lake and actually they became unconscious. So Yudhisthir uh, was asked by the lake, some voice appeared and he said, answer my questions and your brother will live, your brothers will live. So Yudhisthir said, okay, what are your questions? And one of the questions was, what is the most amazing thing in this world? <laughs> and Yudhisthir answered, people see around them their relatives dying, their friends dying, their parents dying, but they think they're gonna live forever. Very instructive, very, very instructive. So we should not be under this illusion that we're gonna live forever. We actually should be planning our life in such a way that we will leave this life. What will happen to us? Not in a depressing way, actually, it's a liberating way. Anyway, we'll talk more about that when we go into the Gita in detail. Okay, so according to the conditions. Then they hid themselves in a place, uh, where is this place? Virat's court, King Virat. He got his protection. They were hidden, they were disguised. They completed the 13th year. Duryodhana never accepted because there was a war. They realized, the, the Kauros realized the Pandavas must be in the kingdom of Virat's. So they went there and single-handedly uh, Arjun defeated all of them, single-handedly. But at that time, the 14th year was up, the 13th year was up, but Duryodhan uh, disputed that and he never got over that. So um, they realized that war is, is gonna take place. So they knew Krishna was the most powerful, both Arjun and uh, Duryodhan went to Krishna and um, Arjun, of course, went as a friend. Duryodhana went to get Krishna's army. And when Krishna woke up, he saw Arjun first being very humble. So he said to Arjun, what do you want? Duryodhana said, hey, I was here first. Krishna said, doesn't matter. I saw Arjun first. I'll let him choose what he wants. He can have me or he can have my army. And I promise I won't fight. So of course, Arjun being the great devotee he is, he picked Krishna. And Duryodhan thought, what a fool. I've got the army now. <laughs> and Krishna is not even gonna fight in this army. And Krishna actually challenged Arjun. Why did you pick me? You should have picked the army. Krishna said, no. Arjun said, no. If, if you're with me, it doesn't matter if I lose. And I won't lose because you're with me. <laughs> so it's really clever. So we also have to, be devotional like that. Take the side of God. Always be with God. And we'll never lose. Okay. Um, so the, the, the king also realized, he sent an envoy. He sent Sanjay to you this day. And he said, be happy where you are. Foolish thing. Be happy where you are. <laughs> Yudhisthir sent uh, a message that actually we are Kshatriyas and we have to rule something. So he sent Krishna on his behalf as an emissary, peace dude. And Krishna simply said, give them five villages and that's enough for them. They don't need any more. They're Kshatriyas, they have to rule. Duryodhan was so foolish, he said, I won't give them even the piece of land that can be on a needle. And he said to Krishna, I'm going to imprison you. So this is a Duryodhana here, ordering his guards. Imprison Krishna. And Krishna said, all right, try it. At that time, Krishna revealed his universal form, a partial universal form, the Viratrup. And a lot of the 
people in that court, like Bhishma and Drona, could see. Even Dhritarashtra was given partial vision to see this incredible universal form of the Lord. Duryodhan, however, he couldn't even look at this effulgent form. <laughs> and uh, the other kings uh, had to close their eyes. Only a few people could see this incredible form. So even that peace mission, Krishna tried. This is the beauty of Krishna. He doesn't control us. He doesn't force us to do anything. He will allow us our independence. So one could argue Krishna could have stopped this battle by stopping, um, by uh, making Duryodhan um, hand over some of the kingdom, forcing him as God. But then that would be dictatorship. But Krishna doesn't believe in dictatorship. He believes in giving us our independence so that we can do what we want to do. He would like us to love him um, because he loves us very much. And he loves Duryodhan as much as he loves Arjun. Nobody is exempt from being loved by Krishna or being his devotee. This is the beauty of the Lord. He says in the Bhagavad Gita, I'm impartial. Of course, he is partial to his devotees, but anybody can be his devotee. That's the point. So anyway, Krishna even went to Kern. He revealed that these are your brothers, the Pandavas, and I'll make you, I will make you king. Just change your side. But Kern, he had been just so corrupted by the association of Duryodhan, he didn't even, even, even listen to Krishna. He stuck to his guns, Duryodhan was there for me, I will be there for him, even though he's such a crazy fool. <laughs> so then the preparation for war began. So we've, we're out of time. Um, the Kauravs, they, they had 11, 11 divisions, far more than um, the Pandavas, 2.4 million warriors. And the Pandavas had seven divisions, 1.5 million warriors. But also the Kauravas had the greatest warrior. They had Bhishma, who had been promised, who had been given the boon that he could never be killed unless he wanted to die. So setting the scene for the Mahabharat, we'll talk about chapter one, uh, which also sets the scene of sorry, Bhagavad Gita. Uh, setting the scene, the two uh, sides were opposing each other. And on the side of the Karvas was the great Bhishma, the Dronacharya, there was um, Kripacharya, Duryodhan and his brothers. And on the other side, there was the five Pandavas, the, the, just the Dumna, and Krishna was the chariot driver of Arjun. The war could not be averted, the war was required in order to reduce the burden on this earth of these uh, irreligious kings. And the Pandavas, they had tried their best to avoid the war, as had Krishna. Um, the Kauravas had done their best to be punished. Uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada explains that for which uh, they had to be punished, they were punished. They kidnapped uh, at one point, um, sorry, they tried to burn the house down of uh, the Pandavas. They stole their property. They tried to kill them in so many different ways. Um, they abused their wife. Um, all of these, according to Vedic principles, require the death sentence. So this war, uh, generally wars are not justified unless they're sanctioned by the Supreme Lord. This one was sanctioned by the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna. In fact, he was present on the battlefield. So I wanted to stop there and um, thank you very much for um, giving us the opportunity to summarize the Mahabharat. If there are any questions, uh, We've got a couple of minutes. You're welcome to ask. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hare um, Krishna. I have question, but uh, I would ask it some other time. We, because in this uh, 
um, introduction that you that you posted uh, uh, in the discipline search section. And so I have a few, few questions there that, that can be answered later because we don't have time today. Um, one little thing I would like to point out, um, Karna, he was not raised by Sanjayas and his wife. He was raised by the first charioteer whose name was Adhirat. Oh, yes, yes. Adhirat and good, point, good point. Yes, well done. Thank you for, <laughs> yes, thank you for um, clarifying that point. Appreciate that. Thank Anybody, you. any questions or any comments? Prabhuji, my son Yashwardhan has a question for you. Very good. Very good. <laughs> How much times have you read the Bhagavad Gita? <laughs> um, um, many times. Many times. But actually, every but actually, time. Every time. I'm just going to mute you because we're, mute you because we're getting an echo. Every time I read it, it's like I'm reading it for the first time. Because every time I read it, so much nectar, so much instructions come from the Bhagavad Gita. So much uh, realizations come from the instructions of Krishna to Arjuna. So you can read it many, many, many times. You know, you, the storybooks you get in school, you read it once and you throw it away. <laughs> but the Bhagavad Gita, you can read it again and again. Mahatma Gandhi says, every time I feel difficulty in this world, I pick up the Bhagavad Gita and I find a verse which gives me solace, which gives me peace. So this is an eternal scripture. We can have read it many, many, many times, but every time we pick it's it up, fresh. it's ever fresh. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Does that make sense, uh, Rajiv? You can unmute yourself. Sorry, I had to mute sure, you. Then. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, and uh, your son's name again? Yashwardhan. Very, very good boy. You can call him Yash if you want. Yash. Mm -hmm. That Yash. sounds good. That sounds good. Thank you for joining. Uh, and thank you for your son. I hope you can join us going forward. I'm just going to go into the schedule. Is there anybody else uh, got any questions before I just go into how we want to approach the next uh, few sessions? Okay. Is this one Carlos? Oh, Carlos, yes. Hi, well, Prabhuji, thank you so much for uh, your class today. Um, I just had a question, a uh, simple question. Will this be posted online on your uh, YouTube channel? Yes, yes it it's will. on the YouTube. It and, will be. And yes. if you want the notes, you can just uh, drop your WhatsApp number in the, in the chat, and uh, we'll put you in the group, uh, which only has information about uh, the seminars and the notes, et cetera. Perfect. Thank you so much. I will drop the uh, the number there on the chat. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you for joining. I hope you found it useful. <laughs> of course I do, Prabhuji. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, what I was planning and happy to discuss uh, if this doesn't suit everybody, I do want to take everybody on this journey with us. Um, we, we started today at seven. Uh, this is all GMT, of course, uh, Greenwich Mean Time. Um, and we spent about 15 minutes on a beautiful bhajan. So we'll try to do that. So if you are able to join us uh, at that time. And then I was thinking we would do it a little differently from what we were originally planning. We'd spend 15, first 15 minutes doing a summary of the chapter, if that's okay with the devotees. And then it'll be about half an hour to recite all the verses. Now, we want to try this. Uh, I really want to, if, if it's, only originally I didn't like the idea of chanting all the Sanskrit verses, but then Bauna Ben convinced me by one comment saying, it'd be nice. <laughs> so I wanna try to recite the, the Sanskrit and the English verses. So once we have a summary of the chapter, it might be um, okay to go through all the verses and hopefully pick up uh, the summary as we're going through the verses, if that makes sense. So the summary will hopefully help understand the verses through the, uh, uh, as we are reciting them. And then I was thinking we'd spend 15 minutes um, on the lessons from this chapter. That's the most important thing because um, the idea of, of reading the Gita or, or learning the Gita is to um, 
put into practice into our own lives. And there are many, many lessons. We've extracted 70 odd lessons from the Bhagavad Gita. And that was just one, one, uh, one go uh, when we did it last time um, as, as a series of lectures. So this would be a very useful exercise. And then 15 minutes question and answers and then we'd finish at half eight. I hope that suits everybody. Um, if it doesn't suit and you don't want to speak out, uh, please do message us or talk to us privately. And this is really an experiment. This, this, this half an hour is an experiment because we want to recite the Sanskrit because that's what was spoken or sung and to actually tap into what was sung in, uh, in the Bhagavad Gita is actually a phenomenal experience to go through. So I'm hoping we'll be able to do that. <laughs> But if it takes too long and it diverts us from the lessons, the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita, then we may have to curtail the Sanskrit reading just to the key verses. So I hope that's okay. We can try Hare it. Krishna, Prabhuji. Hare yes. Krishna. I think that is a good idea, but I think we should keep the Sanskrit because we are losing this uh, ability of um, reciting in Sanskrit. English, yeah, everybody can read. But Sanskrit is not the important thing here, Mataji. The important thing is to, to, to change our consciousness through the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita. Sanskrit is good if we can do it, but if it diverts us from the learning, then we've missed the point of the Gita. Yes, that I, I do understand. I do appreciate your, um, your concern about it. But the, um, it will be nice for if we could at least try to recite in, in Sanskrit also. Because That's, what if we say, That's what I'm saying. We, we're going to try. We'll see how it goes for the first chapter. And then we'll review uh, how it goes. So are we going to do one chapter in one session? Yeah. Uh, at least the, at least, um, the, smaller, ones. the smaller chapters. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maji, for that feedback. So Gita Jayanti, just to let the audience know, is in two weeks' time, two weeks today, in fact, on Christmas Day. Um, and that day is very, very auspicious. It's Moksha Dikadashi. Um, and the day when the Bhagavad Gita was actually sung by Krishna to Arjun. So it's, it's the birthday of the Bhagavad Gita. Traditionally, we uh, recite in Sanskrit, the whole uh, Bhagavad Gita, all 700 verses um, in one go. In one go. <laughs> every chapter, after every chapter, we have um, a, a small summary of two to three minutes. So we want to coordinate this with actually the South African devotees because um, they also will do something similar. We're proposing time of 2 p.m. GMT to 8 p.m. That might not suit them. So this might be a little bit earlier, like one o'clock or 12 o'clock. Please do join that day. That evening, we, we won't have the Bhagavad Gita session because we'll be reciting the whole Bhagavad Gita uh, as, uh, anyway. So please do join. That day, uh, of course, Christmas Day, you may want to spend with the family. We understand. That's why we've tried to keep it at two so that you can have at least lunch with them. But invite the family. Um, next week, we'll start with chapter one. Please invite your friends, relatives, anybody you think may have maybe even a little bit interested in this, because this is a really rare opportunity to be able to do this together with everybody. And anybody who wants to recite in Sanskrit, do let us know. Uh, may be able to do one chapter. Um, this, um, just to let the audience who don't know, um, now, one thing with Vedic knowledge is it should never be sold. So we're not charging for these seminars and we never will right? because Vedic knowledge should always be given. Um, however, it is good if uh, some Dakshina is given. Now, we don't want anything personally because by the Lord's mercy, uh, he's made enough arrangements for us. So... We do would would regret we would request to help some cause. One cause is this Iskon Pune. They are going to be distributing Bhagavad Gitas. 
um, at, at literally like 100 rupees uh, per Bhagavad Gita to schools, colleges, libraries, hospitals. So we're supporting them. Today we started the campaign and so far, I think we've got sponsorship for 600, 600 Bhagavad Gitas. So um, if you don't want to do this one, do something else. Uh, I don't, we don't mind. Um, yeah. So this is all part of the Pro Parts Christmas Marathon. So uh, that was just a small request we'd like to make to the devotees. So Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai. Thank you very, very much for joining us. I hope you found this session useful. Uh, apologies for mistakes um, and apologies if uh, uh, we didn't come across properly. Um, and we look forward to seeing everybody next Friday at uh, seven o'clock. Even if you're here by 7.15 or even half seven, it's okay. Uh, we do understand that people working and um, everybody has quite a lot on their schedule. Oh, hi, hi, Michael. Yeah, hello there. Uh, sorry I was late today. I didn't realize the time had changed. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, we haven't actually started uh, yet because this is all the prelude to the Gita next week. All right. Well, thank you very much. Very interesting. Okay. And thank you very much for joining. And uh, please, if, 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 there's, if there's anything that we can do to improve, uh, and there will be lots, I'm happy for feedback to come so that we can deliver um, properly. I oh, know, no, you're, you're doing an excellent job. It's very informative and it's very easy to follow. There's a lot to follow, uh, but you're, you're doing a very good job. Thank you. Yeah, today was a lot. Um, uh, apologies for that. No, don't apologize. No, no, I've been making my notes. No, no, it's just, uh, no, it's very good. Thank you. And did you receive the notes from last time? No, maybe I gave you the wrong email address. Okay, it's much easier if it's possible through WhatsApp. Or is okay. that difficult for you? No, no, it's not difficult, no, no. Okay, if you send us your WhatsApp, uh, that would be better. <laughs> okay. All right, I'll, I'll send you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. We're going to continue, sorry? Oh, Kanchan. Yes, Kamakshi. Uh, I was just wondering, my friend Hina said she wanted to come on to see the Ekadashi Katha. So I was just wondering, are you going to- We're just going to carry on with this, yeah. yeah okay. Okay. That's fine. That's thank okay. you, Kamakshi. <laughs> Okay. And uh, pretty, yeah. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Thanks for this. Um, always learn something new. Um, you know, I've heard the Mahabharat story a few times, but today just picked up on what you said about Gurn, where um, where uh, he, he knew he was powerful, he didn't know who he was, and um, that mm. ego got the better of him, you know, like um, trying to prove to people, um, mm. like didn't like being um, judged or dismissed due to you know his background and wanted people to see his ability so that was nice to hear that reflection oh, thank you thank you for sharing mm. thank you for joining mm. okay so so, the yes so i'm going to stop this recording so if anybody wants to stay on you're pretty very welcome to stay on we're going to talk about today today is a very important day uh, it's an Ikadashi, so we want to explain the significance of today. Um, and of course, if you want to leave, thank you very much for joining. It's been a long session. I really appreciate your time. And I hope uh, we've been able to give you something of some value for the time that you've given up. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, is it Ankit? No, Michael. Oh, Michael. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Oh, yes, uh, he, I think he's given a message. So, oh. Hare Krishna Radhika.